All right, we're back. Um, so thank you so much for joining another episode of Celeste Therapist Podcast. Um, I have David again with me. I'm going to have you introduce yourself to my audience. Yes. Hello. My name is David Archer from the, the lands of Montreal, Canada, anti-racist psychotherapist, black meditator, author, and I do a whole bunch of other stuff that hopefully we'll be able to talk about today. Yes. And so episode 344, anti-racist psychotherapy, confronting systemic racism and healing racial trauma. If you haven't listened to that episode, I suggest you listen to that first and then come back to hear about black meditation because mm -hmm. this is an important conversation um, where we kind of talked about the different ways in which um, systems has kind of held us back with our way of thinking and so many other things. But then we kind of ended the conversation talking about healing and um, you created this book called Black Meditation. Can you explain mm -hmm. to people like why you decided to create uh, this book for people? For sure. So the thing is that, uh, and as uh, Celeste and I were talking about in uh, the last talk, is uh, that we ourselves are Black therapists. And as a Black therapist, there's a certain type of skill set that we have, is that um, we needed to navigate through certain systems in order to get our credentials. We also had to work with certain people who might have been looking for a Black therapist. And what I noticed, uh, especially through the pandemic, is that, and also because of the George Floyd protests, like, you know, the a lot of the violence that took place towards Breonna Taylor, towards Ahmaud Arbery, all of these individuals, it made it so that there was this increase in racial consciousness that took place. Uh, it made it so that I think that a lot of what happened in the States, it had like echoes throughout the world. And also because Canadian news news is kind of boring. So a lot of Canadians, we, we watch American news anyway. So the thing is that uh, I realized that what was taking place in the United States, it also was impacting Canadians, is also impacting a lot of people around the world. We're waking up and understanding that there does seem to be this disparity in terms of what happens if you're Black versus if you're not Black. And all of that, all of that suffering, meeting with the clients who were looking specifically for a Black therapist, uh, seeing, hearing a lot of stories of Black people feeling as if they weren't getting the mental health support that they needed, me being packed uh, with clients, unable to take on and unable to refer because I don't know many other people who have the approach that I, that I use, uh, especially because there's a there's different culture relating to racism that exists in your country versus mine. It's like it uh, it caused uh, an anger in me. It caused uh, uh, intense, like, um, I didn't feel good. I didn't like uh, uh, a lot of the pain and the suffering that I, that I was experiencing. And so I used that anger uh, to create things. Instead of using the anger to destroy myself and to harm myself, which a lot of other people do through either substance abuse and other like uh, unhealthy things, it's like, yo, I'm going to put this anger into words. That's what allowed me to be able to channel the energy and the motivation to write anti-racist psychotherapy. And I noticed that anti-racist psychotherapy was helpful for the intellect and the intellectual side and the, the research and science and all that stuff. But I also needed something that was helpful for the body, to heal the body that has been listening to these stories of these difficulties and these traumas. And so while Black Meditation, 10 Practices for Self-Care, Mindfulness, and Self-Determination, which is the full title, while it's not like a substitute for an actual therapist that you can speak to, it's as close as, as I was able to get to being able to reach people outside of my office. So there were some people who, uh, who may not have access to a therapist. They may not have access to you know, a meditation retreat or something. But I wanted to write a book where even if a person is by themselves, that they're able to connect with an idea and a collective of, of, uh, of methods of recovery that transcend these physical limitations that we have. That's really good. Um, and I, you know, I, I, sh I was sharing with you and people who follow my social media, I talk a lot about at night, you know, I meditate with my family. I 
start it with two minutes. Um, I do it on my, I feel like at baseline, I'm in a mindfulness meditative state. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that, um, when people think of it, it's, they have this negative connotation because it's associated with more white culture. Um, when that stuff actually came from us, right? Yeah, it's interesting. And I, and I think it's important to kind of share with people that like our ancestors, um, used a lot of like we are, we were therapists and without the, uh, schooling that like mm -hmm. the barriers of the, of the degrees and stuff like that. Um, the trees, we hugging the trees was mm -hmm. part of our healing and, and ta it's something about, you know, I, when I, when I get to the water part near my house and I just like breathe fresh air when I'm hiking, it just like rejuvenates me. And it's like, how is this in my backyard? And and no one told me about it. For real. But I remember, um, <laughs> I remember I, I would see white people running out. I, I, I would be like, what's wrong with them? It's cold. Why are they running? They trying to get that <laughs> healing. I didn't know that. I didn't know what was going on. I just thought they was crazy. Right. <laughs> And now, like you see, now people, black people, be like, "Why are you in the woods? I'm trying to get that healing." Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, um, can you share with people um, about like how meditation is not a white thing? It's yeah, um, okay. Well, it's just it's I because mean, of, yeah, it's because like uh, this uh, Jamaicans we say that's that's white people thing, you know, and it's, and it's the same thing. <laughs> Even if it's yo, it's like we're different cultures, like. <laughs> But it's it's like black people are able to get that, you know. Like, I came you know, straight from the hood, so we was no meditating, no yeah. man, and we running from somebody or dog, not <laughs> not to just be running for no reason. We weren't doing that. <laughs> but but it's just that, yo, know, this is this is why it's like in this period of awakening of people understanding Wagwan, like what's going on is that we're understanding that when they say that therapy is not for black people or that we're like, yo, that's white people thing to go to therapy, but that's the thing that heals you. And in the same way, how we're like, yo, that's white people thing to, to meditate. Yo, that's the thing that heals you. Like a lot of, this is what I meant. And this is what I mean when we say that we internalize the oppression is that um, in Jamaican culture, like when I was young and many other people are Jamaican, or even if you're not Jamaican, you might be able to understand something like this, you know? So if you do the wrong thing, then you get licks. This is what we call it. And licks is like belt, slippers, any object that travels at a velocity in the air. Okay. Very quickly. My parents never played professional sports, but anyways, the thing is, uh, so what happens though, is that um, the word licks refers to the lick of the whip. So when we are disciplining our children and calling it licks, we're referring to what uh, white enslavers did to us to punish us. So then our idea of punishment is so intertwined with discipline. Like there's a lot of things in our culture that and words that we use to express and to describe what we as black people do that is part of this internalized oppression. The only way that we get the space to be able to differentiate between what was helpful from our past or what was like a, like an introjector, like in, inserted into our, our idea of relating to each other is that is very violent and very unhelpful for us is if we can take the space to sit and meditate. Meditation itself, yes, it's true that there's Eastern elements to it. Uh, meditate. The reason why a lot of what uh, black people might be like, yo, that's white people stuff is because for some reason, whenever we think yoga, we're going to think a white woman who eats kale and, and, uh, and I don't know, has cat pictures on her face, but I don't know. But the interesting thing is that this idea of being able to sit and to acknowledge and to connect with nature existed and predates all religions. This idea of us being able to sit and being able to appreciate space and time and listen to the breath the only reason why we have this is because like there's not many other species that sit and close their eyes and breathe and feel alert most other animals they need to keep like an ear up or an eye around to be like safe and to be but humans what we're able to do is we're able to sit we're able to breathe and with mindfulness we're able to repair our our brains we can repair our pain and our suffering by being able to sit and acknowledge.
Mm-hmm. And so I think one of the reasons why I wrote this was for us to know that the healing is not just limited to the ivory tower or to the university or to any of the people with their fancy ties or their fancy suits or the alphabet after their, their name. Uh, we are the healer. We are descendant. We, uh, we are descendants of generations of healers. Absolutely. Our culture, our dances, the dance is to move. It's to get exercise. Our singing, our humming that even if you're a black person, you may not have the same culture as me. It's like your mother humming or your grandmother humming. These were all ways of self-soothing. This may not be like the um of the meditation, but the humming they would do would, would calm your nervous system. So what I'm very interested in is how we can kind of connect to that unknown ancestor and connect to this meditation and this capacity of healing that exists in all people, every yeah. single one of us. Yeah. Uh, and I just kind of want to make a point, like part of, I, I interject at times to kind of uh, teach people. And I think the discipline aspect that you talk about, there's this book called what happened to you that I just started reading mm. with Oprah Winfrey and then uh, a psychiatrist. I can't think of his name um, mm-hmm. where at the beginning, they talk about the discipline aspect and how a lot of that came from just the, the slave culture, yeah. and, um, the, the whipping and, and things like that. So um, it's a really great like read um, for people that may be struggling with how they are. Um, they got they go back and forth over ask questions and the psychiatrist kind of answers um, around that because the brain is about like the the psychological effects yes. which we talked about in the last episode like with PTSD. Um, so I wanted to make that point. Another point I wanted to make you talked about um, you know the idea of being stillness. You know, mm. I, one one of the things that I I do um, is I listen to motivational videos. Um, and I, I tell people like, that's my medicine, like hiking, like I do a lot of things to live life. I've survived most of my life and now I'm in a state of living. Mm-hmm. It talked about humans. And how we tend to live in a stressful state. We keep mm-hmm. ourselves sick. Yep. We keep ourselves sick with our way of thinking. The flight and fight response is to help us kind of get through hard moments. Yeah. But unfortunately, we end up staying in that state of mind. And we're not supposed to be that way. It's not supposed to be that way. And one of the things you said in another podcast is sometimes the bravest thing you can do is just sit. For real. Um, recognize accept validate show compassion Mm. if you can share with people about uh the steps to sitting or the steps to meditation so they don't think they have to sit on a rock and make humming noises all day right that's true because not all of us have access to the tibetan mountains there you go um, yes yes or, or caves or any any of that stuff and the the thing is um because i was speaking to my brother uh, talking about uh, uh, this book, and he said, "Yo, like, like Dave, you should just tell them that, like, if they've never meditated before, they've all been through confinement." <laughs> and it's kind of true, is that many people are like, "Yo, like, I've never had time to be able to sit down." And it's like, "Yo, you got time now, man." <laughs> yo, it's like <laughs> telling you, we tell ourselves we don't have time. I tell people, look at your screen time on your phone. We, you mm-hmm. got time. You got time. Yes. And if we're wondering where all the time went, just know about the social media and all that. It is like engineered specifically to take your time and to take your attention. And so uh, what would you do with all that extra time that you're not scrolling, looking at, I don't know, cat pictures? I don't know why I say cat pictures. Yeah, I was going to say, what's up with you with cats? I don't know. Man. <laughs> well, it's, it's not me. It's everyone else. It's not me. For me, I look at, uh, I meditate, I write about racism and <laughs> read about uh read about therapy and play video games that's my life but apart from all of that is also meditating so uh not everyone needs to do the same form of meditation so there are some people that their meditation just like as you explained is just really um because i'm lucky enough that i live near a forest so i'm able to actually go and see trees and now it's like it's kind of cold we have um minus 20 degrees celsius over here so it's pretty 
pretty cold right now. But the interesting thing is that when you go outside and when you're able to actually see a tree, you have no choice but to uh, look at the tree and understand that it's part of an ecosystem. You have no choice when you're in nature to smell the, the air and to also like feel the experience of the oxygen, to be aware of the temperature of the area. And all of these little things of being able to put your attention instead of on your smartphone, but putting it on the most sophisticated technology we have available of just noticing the body. These are ways of being able to ground yourself. What has happened though, is that many of us have come from backgrounds where we have been traumatized or attacked in different types of ways. And so then the body becomes a little unsafe. So that's why if it is that the breath and just starting off with breathing is a little bit challenging, there's also writing exercises that are in the book as well. Many times through these writing exercises, through these breathing exercises, what we are trying to do in order to center ourselves is returning to the present moment. Many of our stresses that we have are either based on things that have happened in the past or things that can happen in the future. But when we are able to express gratitude for the, the miracle of life that we have, when we are able to express, you know, like five things that we're grateful for, then there's something that takes place not only at that, uh, at the cognitive level, but even in, it's, it's like a, it's a mind body thing that takes place. When we are able to say, I'm grateful for the fact that I was able to have a meal today. And the, gra the gratitude doesn't need to be great, uh, huge things. I'm grateful for the fact that there's a roof that's over my head. I'm grateful for the fact that I was able to, to connect and listen to a podcast. There's many people who don't have access to the internet. Uh, when we are able to count our blessings, then us feeling blessed, then instead of it being the exception, it starts to become the rule and the experience is that our natural state as Celeste was saying, be becomes one of being mindful, being attentive to what it is that's taking place. And our job, a lot of it, is to just alter that old familiarity that says that this is our experience. So there are ways that you can sit and meditate. There's, of course, like uh, things that are explained in the book, but I want people to know also that there's not just one way of being able to center yourself as well, that it's this is just my perspective and I interviewed, there's like, what, six other meditators that I interviewed in this? So thing is that there's other people as well, because I don't believe there's only one definition of black. And yeah, I it was like six don't people believe. that you, you yeah. uh, at the end. Yeah, so it's, it's not just one definition of black and not just one definition of black meditation. So that's what I, what I was trying to impart. Yeah, and I, and I, I gather that from um, the way that you talk about it. Mm -hmm. And just, um, you know, for people that uh, may struggle, um, I started off with my kids two minutes a night. Mm -hmm. And at first they was, oh, why do I got to do that? This was like in July. Now, um, me and my husband went away last weekend and um, they text us and I was like, oh, we're about to meditate. Yeah. And we're up to 10 minutes now. So every night, 10 minutes, it just kind of like really relaxes their body. And it's usually mm -hmm. a guided meditation we find on YouTube for free. There we go. Um, so, you know, I always like to throw out the free resources um, mm -hmm. that I can access. Um, so I just kind of want to like encourage people around that part around like it doesn't have to be no crazy like and plus like their body resisted it. Now their body craves it because they've been doing yes. it for months. And the idea of something that he also said that's powerful is because, you know, our our mind doesn't have concept of time. Right. So if you are not becoming mindful, you're either worried about the future, or you could be dwelling on the past. You have to interrupt that cycle and that grounding, like even if you don't have a, a tree in your backyard or um, that fresh air or the water, um, you know, you can, even in the shower is mm -hmm. a way to, to start with the groundingness because the goal is to get into the present. And I know the present can sometimes feel painful, but that's where your control is, is in the now. Mm -hmm. We can't control the past and we can't control the future, but we can look at the now. And that's why when David talks about that, that's why it's so powerful because when you're outside of the now, that's room for anxiety to grow. Mm -hmm. um, and I think with the way society is operating now with the pandemic and, and so much happening, even when the pandemic first started as a therapist, 
my goal was to just get people in the now. I didn't even know what was going on, right? Like I, 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 I didn't know what was going to happen tomorrow. I didn't know where this pandemic thing was going. I didn't know it was going to be two years in. So I was like, you know, what can we control? And I really want people to think about like why like the meditation piece can be so powerful and the mindfulness. And I know I said like I, I do it at baseline, but you know, it took me a while to get to that point. I, as I said, I did EMDR. So I was really like all over the place. When you mm-hmm. do an EMDR, you're struggling really bad. And I always tell people that because I want them to have hope and know that like this healing is for you. Um, and, and so I think this idea of of meditating, my favorite artist, J. Cole, um, he talks about meditating. He used to talk, you know, he grew up around like weed and, and drugs and he has a lot of friends. And in and, and, um, one of his songs, he says meditation helped him so much. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's because you're able to sit and, and I'll tell you one more thing and I just want you to piggyback off of it. Um, when I went into private practice, I was, I didn't have coworkers, right? I didn't realize like how lonely this entrepreneurship mm-hmm. journey was going to be. <laughs> And, um, I was forced to look within and, mm. and I, and I, and then that was in 2016. And from that, that's when I really started to get more mindful and more spiritual. And when yes. I say spiritual, it's not religion. It's not like a church I went to. It's more so of when I'm still, I get more answers. I get clarity and, um, you can't find clarity on the news. Right. Exactly. And, and as, right. as David and I talked last session about, all the images and all those things that are mm-hmm. being shown, you, we got to unplug, you know, and unplugging at initially can feel hard for me. It's like the best thing ever. Like when I'm, when I'm plugged in, I'm like, Oh, I feel like I'm wasting my time. Mm-hmm. Right. Because I'm so used to being unplugged and I'm so used to tapping into other resources. Um, but I want David to kind of piggyback because I'm just sharing my personal experience. Um, but I just kind of, and I know you've had personal experience, but as a provider and, as someone who created this amazing book called Black Meditation, I really want you to tell people how much you can get in touch with like answers and um, things that you yeah. need by being still. Yeah. So um, I do think, again, that um, um, what happens is that because we're impacted by so many different messages, and I speak to people who have been through a lot of trauma and a lot of difficulties. So sometimes it's hard for them to tell the difference between their consciousness and their intuition or like the negative beliefs that have taken place and that inner voice that's there to help and guide them. When you're talking about like private practice, it's a similar thing for me as well. Is that, uh, but for me, again, I'm an introvert. So I'm the type of person that pandemic's going on. All right, cool. Yo, I'm going to read a book. I'm chilling. Yo, I'm going to, so I'm I'm a little different from my extroverted clients. They were struggling. But as an introvert, I was like, yo, I got this. Yo, I can do this. I got this. You know, so anyways. But it's just to say that um, uh, it's, <laughs> I kind of lost track. On what no, it's okay. Was, but yeah. You no, want to be a piggy, you. piggyback? Okay. What do you yeah. want me to piggyback on? I want you to piggyback off of the idea that stillness, there's a lot of wisdom and guidance in stillness. Yes, yes, but yes. But it's you hard. See- it's a hard way to go. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but you see, this is how present I am. This is, I forgot what it, what it was that you said. So it's just to say, um, <laughs> I think that um, if we're talking about stillness, it's it's just to say that there's so many messages that are out there about, uh, if I can bring it into the direction of being Black for a second, is that um, the Black body oftentimes needs to be in this fight, flight, or freeze uh, energy. Is that we're always on the move. It's kind of like if we look at the clock hand, it's like if you look at the news cycle, it's like black people are always at 12 o'clock and sometimes we're at six o'clock too. Is that for some reason it always comes back to some big story that gets all black people up up in arms about everything. We don't always hear a lot of big stories about Asian people in the news. We're going to hear it about white people, but for some reason it's always that black people are centered in this uh, in this story even though there's not a lot of us in my country there's not a lot of us like it's not it's not as if it's 50 50 with black people and white people in your country either like for the proportion of the amount of them but it's like we're always at the center and when these stories take place it universalizes the experience of all black people so all black people have this opinion about the black person that's on the news or something like that the same thing doesn't happen for white people so 
all of that is a function and that that is more explained in anti-racist psychotherapy but i do talk about it in black meditation as well is that we have to even not only is it that we need to decolonize our psychotherapy but we also need to decolonize our own minds about what it means to be a black person and when we are able to shift our identity and shift our understanding that these are the things that are acting upon us, then we can make a bit more space to think about what it is that allows us to heal. So I believe that many of our old traditions before enslavement and before our, our colonizations and all of that may have had a connection with ancestral knowledge and ancestral healing. I believe that many of the clients that I meet who have a lot of difficulties when I see their problem and then I ask them, yo, can you tell me about your upbringing? Then I'm like, okay, yo, that's the reason. I'm like, okay, that makes sense. Or if I ask them, yo, how were your parents' parents? What was the parenting that your parents went through? Then I'm like, okay, yo, that, that makes perfect sense. So if that, it's called a genogram that I use. And it's like, you get your family system and like your local, like your parents, your grandparents and all of that because it helps to be able to see where these patterns began to emerge. So if it is that we can see in the immediate family system that there are some patterns that were created by the trauma that was sustained by the parents and by the grandparents, there must also be resilience. It's not only the suffering that took place, there might also be good things that you gained from surviving from your parents' uh, survival and your grandparents' survival. So when we are able to sit in silence, when we are able to heal from some of our pain and our suffering, I believe that we're also able to tap into the resources and resilience of our previous unknown ancestors. As Black people, a lot of us may, well, I'm going to speak for myself and for my West Indian, my Caribbean uh, clients and all that. Um, there's there's points of our genogram where it's un, un, like you can't access. It's like an unknown father or an unknown mother which is not very different from what would happen with enslavement, where they would just ship a family member different, like in a different location, and you can't locate that family member anywhere. So this is what I mean about the continuation of patterns, that even that idea that the father is gone, the mother is gone, someone's in jail, someone's not there, even that comes from enslavement. But I believe that there's also resilience from unknown ancestors that was passed on down to us. So there's some family members that will say, or some clients that will tell that will tell me, well, in my family, it's the women who are healers, or in my family, there were certain, some of the, us as men, we had this gift, some of us as women had this gift. When we are able to sit in silence, I believe that we are able to tap into these gifts. We are able to tap into this inner resilience that has no name, it's not English, it's not French, it's not Spanish, it's something that's much older that we are trying to tap into, that is keeping us alive, and that is part of the spirit of the individual. There's something that's very deep that cannot be accessed by Facebook, by social media. There's something that's very deep in the individual that is even responsible for their healing. And when we practice our meditations, when we practice our ceremonies, we can get in touch with that. As Celeste was speaking about, with the children initially for all people the idea of sitting down nobody wants to do that no one wants to sit down um some people they don't want to sit down because they'll realize how much they've been running from uh, from the things uh, that are in their mind but if we are able to carve out a little bit of time we get better at it as we get better at it you start to realize that the meditation allows for you to purge out certain types of thoughts you start to realize that the body feels a little bit lighter that the heart feels a little bit lighter. As you practice, if it's not with sitting, then it may be with the writing exercises, you start to realize that things are a little, it's a little bit easier to make decisions about things. You start to realize the importance of positive peer networks, not having these bad mind people around you, not having people that are trying to pull you down, crabs in a barrel syndrome, trying to keep you out, like with the white racism and all of that stuff. You start to realize who is your family? Like who are the people who care for you? And as you start to see that, you start to see the importance of caring for yourself. And so Black meditation is designed to get in touch with what it means to be a Black person, to redefine what that means, 
and to get in touch with this capacity of knowing that healing is not just something that you do, but it's a large part of who you are. Yes, I love that. Um, and it's available to us all. And I just, you know, when, when David said, you, you know, running away from the problem, you, remember, like, you can never run away from your mind. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, as I always say the audacity of us to think that we can escape our mind, our experiences. Um, and the goal is not to, to operate from our wounds, but to operate mm -hmm. um, from a, a healing space. But you can't operate from that healing space if you're not able to sit and kind of like reconcile and um, look at what has happened. And I, I do want to say like that can be a painful experience when I'm walking people through this journey. It can sure. feel really hard, right? Um, but understand on the other side of that um, is healing, right? On mm -hmm. the other side. And I think people stop the process because nobody talks. We talk about healing, but a lot of people don't talk about how hard it is to heal. Um, and if we're talking about a physical wound and we're trying to close up a, 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 a you know, a wound or like, you know, it's going to hurt, but we're going to do it because we want our arm to work again. Right. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I, I really want us to have that same mindset for our mind and know that when our mind is healed, when we're in a different space and we could think for ourselves, mm -hmm. um, life looks completely different. Um, for real. And so for real. And just like as Celeste is saying, the metaphor I like to use too, is that let's say that if you, during your day, if you got a paper cut, like a mm -hmm. small little cut, uh, sometimes by the end of the week, you look at your hand and the hand is healed. And that's not because you looked at the finger and you're like, heal the finger, heal the finger. You didn't cast the <laughs> spell on it. You didn't do any ceremony or anything. It's just because the body is predisposed to heal. That's the reason. The body will heal if the proper conditions are, are there for it. Mm -hmm. So the mind works in a similar type of way. Mm -hmm. It may be sometimes though that you know, the pain, like the body can't heal because it needs a disinfectant. It may be sometimes that the mental health issue may need the assistance of a therapist or a close mm -hmm. other person to support you. But just to know that all people are designed to heal. Our ancestors, mm -hmm. they didn't, they didn't fight for nothing. We are here because we have descended from healers. We have descended mm -hmm. from people who are able to adapt to difficult situations. So mm -hmm. as hard as this present situation is for many people, during this coronavirus, this pandemic and all of that. It's just for us to know there's not just one black meditation, but start with one, even if you start with two <clears throat> minutes at a time. Of course, there's many other things you can do in your day, but just for us to have it in the back of our minds that we are continuing this legacy of people who are trying to heal. And then if we do that, if we are able to rewrite our narrative, something different happens. That's, that's what therapy is all about. We're going to do some things that are different because we want something different to happen. Um, just as a key thing, though, because you did mention about EMDR and eye movement desensitization and reprocessing relates to the reprocessing of traumatic experiences and all that. And it's true that that also can be challenging for many people. We know, I, I, do, I talk about healing, but yo, it's hard, man. Healing can be challenging. But I also want to say that what it is that makes it easier for people is to develop resources. Before it is that we confront the trauma of our past, we need little skills, little resources that help us to feel safe, help us to feel secure first. And when we do that, the journey is not as challenging. That's why the book heavily talks about resources. It talks a lot about the idea of developing and practicing the resources, which then makes it a little bit easier for us to deal with the bigger obstacles that are, that are in the path. So we, you know, we start small. You know, you climb the hill before you climb the mountain and, you know, you get your climbing gear before you take the first step. And before you know it, you'll be at the summit. It's a I beautiful love thing. it. Yeah. Thank you for sharing the resources part. And um, Black Meditation is actually available on Kindle as well. I was talking about Kindle because I have it on my phone and I have a Kindle um, because it's like if I'm at the nail shop, we're waiting somewhere. Yeah. I'll click on my, um, I don't always have my Kindle, but I have my phone. So for people that maybe like, oh, I want to read more. That was my thing, right? I'm, all, I'm looking at the barriers. What's preventing me from reading? I don't have the book, so let me get a Kindle. Um, but the, oh, it's free. The um, the Kindle app is free on your phone, so you don't have to buy a new phone. Um, and you can have the book readily available for you, for people. Um, but Black Meditation is a good start. And, um, and the resources, right, is important. And that's a, a huge reason why I started this podcast 
why I have people like you on, because I want people to know there's so many people out here that's doing the work. Um, so I'm like extremely grateful that you reached out to come on the podcast um, because Thank you for having me. you're so freaking amazing. Um, and just, just a mirror reflection of the person I'm talking to. I, I feel like I was listening to me talk when I. Yo, that's what I'm saying. Kendra <laughs> Spirit, man. For real. When I was uh, researching you, I was like, oh, my gosh, he sounds like me. Like, <laughs> mm-hmm, <laughs> we mm-hmm. sound like each other because of we course. have the same mission. So um, if you can leave. Um, my audience. So if somebody's listening to this and they're feeling inspired, um, what would you say to them in this moment right now to help encourage them on their journey of healing? So once again, is that it's a similar thing is that um, sometimes when people will, will like do like a, they'll say like, you know, in a past life, I might've been a king or a queen or something like that. And um, we, we say that because we want to believe that our ancestors were like these uh, majestic individuals. But I, I think that it's more important for us to look at the ordinary as being uh, what is most majestic and what is most important. So I always think about the unknown ancestor, that it could have been like, you know, a mother that, that, like, uh, that didn't have all the gold in the world and all of that, but in some way, shape or form, she was able to nurse and to have a child uh, uh, that was able to survive and brave through the elements and that this mother did every single thing that she could in order to make it so that this child would survive despite the difficulties that she may have experienced. And this is an unknown ancestor. She may have had a name. Most likely the name was not in English because English again is a recent invention, but that's how far back it goes. And I'm even going to say that this unknown mother who had this child and allowed this child to grow, that child may also have had certain struggles and may also have had to brave the elements, find food, find security, find shelter. And this pattern continued itself for more for more years than you can even calculate on your hands, okay? And this pattern of survival, this pattern of love, this pattern of heartache, this pattern of like difficulties and overcoming the difficulties led to you being here today. So this is why I say that for anybody who believes that things are too hard for them right now, just know that there are generations of ancestors who came before you that are supporting you. You may not be able to see them. You may not be able to hear them or speak the same language of them, but I'm letting you know that you are a product of many different souls and many different individuals who did everything that they could to make it so that we are still here today. So if you believe that you yourself are not important, just know that the breaths, the ex, the inhalations and the exhalations that people before you that are so distant from you, that they like, they may not have even known that you would even exist, but they did it all for that specific moment that they were in. So just to know that there are generations of individuals behind you who try to do everything that they could to make it so that you would be able to take in these inhalations and exhalations today. So just know that uh, whoever it is that's listening to this, whoever needs to hear this, is that you are a beautiful person because you are because you exist. That is a miracle that you exist. And let's honor that miracle and let's do the best that we can to just spread compassion to yourself, spread compassion to others, and to continue this gift of life. And uh, and remember that you are a healer because the people who existed before you were also on that journey. Yes, your voice is so soothing. I'm so inspired by you. You're so good. Thank you. Um, I want you to <laughs> tell you. people how they can reach you. But in, in the words of uh, David, uh, you know, I take a lot of notes. I, I'm a slow learner, so I, I have to do that. He says, uh, so recognize, accept, validate, show compassion. And the compassion piece is so near and dear to my heart. I always talk to people about being patient with yourself. It's a journey in listening to us today. And if you listen to the last podcast, you know, like you, you see the systems. I wish I had, I wish I had you. I can hear from you when I, years ago, where were you years ago, David? <laughs> Yo, the ancestors have always been speaking. Okay? I know. And it's the I same know. ancestors. It's just, <laughs> yo, it's like, you're good. Uh, I say, I say the same exact thing, but uh, nothing good. happens before it's rightful time. 
But uh, again, like true. we're hearing it now because we're meant to hear it at this moment. But just to know that that resource is always existing. Yeah, I love it. There. You're awesome. Thank you. Um, how can people reach you if they uh, want to hear more from you? Yeah. So if you want more information, um, again, is that um, you can go on archertherapy.com. That's A-R-C-H-E-R-T-H-E-R-A-P-Y.com. And on that website, you'll be able to hear more about my philosophies, my perspectives. There's other awesome podcasts. I'm going to put up Celeste as soon as I get Woo! the link. Yeah, just, just, yeah, man. And also it's just that, uh, um, for me, it's very important that, um, uh, yeah, like that, you know, that if the book is interesting for you, I'd like to hear your perspectives on it. Oh yeah. Well. I'm going to let um, you know, I'm going to be reaching out to you <laughs> Yeah, for real. Yo, thank you. Thank you. And um, because I have a my first biggest audience is America. The second is Canada. So you, I got a lot of Canada, Canada people listening. I'm talking to one of your people. My Canadian, my fellow Canadians. <laughs> What's going on? Stay warm in Canada. Yes. Oh my God. You <laughs> this has been so awesome. I appreciate you, your transparency, you so your time, your energy, everything that you're doing to help. Um, I feel like one episode at a time is really helping people shift their thought process. So thank you for doing that. I hope so. And and thank you again for inviting me and like having the time to speak with me and uh, many blessings to everyone who's uh, listening to this. I wish you all the best. Thanks.